All right. Hello. Hmm. So today I hit what I am, uh, <laughs> thanks to a, uh, um, a particular non-dual teacher, uh, Bentino Massaro, um, and gave some language for, um, for a very particular type of difficulty that I think shows up all over the place in terms of creating intentional change. What does it mean to bring in manifestation? Um, he refers to it as a day two challenge. I'll get into that in a little bit. But the, 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 the manifestation, the way, the way that it appears is, like for me, yesterday, like the last couple of days, I got this click about, ah, this is the point of free will. This is the stable point of free will as experience. I might change my mind later as I learn more about it, but there's a very clear kind of stability that as long as there is an impression of there being a choice, the place of that choice is in what is intended. That's it. And, uh, just as important, um, maybe arguably more important, is the recognition that um, what isn't intended is not my choice. And it, rather, there are two ways to hear that phrase. Let me try rephrasing it a little bit. Anything other than an intention is not something I have the power to choose. So this is very helpful for things like when I, like if, if I started having some kind of neurological problem that would make it hard for me to control my fingers, that might be frustrating but it doesn't affect my ability to intend to move my fingers. It just affects the relationship between the intention and the manifestation. Doing that gives me a kind of equanimity in my relationship to what appears in the world. It's not my job <laughs> because it's outside of my control. All I can do is work with how, what I, like where, miraculously, for reasons I don't see yet, but for reasons I don't see, my intention shapes things in my experience. And if I can find the relationship between how I move my intention and what happens in the world, then I can intentionally create effects in the world. But the place of control is not the world, the place of control is the intention. So being really clear about that, identifying that really precisely, and then using that to intend alignment with my true nature. We'll, we'll call it that for now, uh, my essence. Uh, at some point here, I'll try to give a video on, another video on what, uh, about how I view that essence. And there's a bit of um, me relating to that clearly myself. And also I'm borrowing fragments from a bunch of frameworks in order to triangulate on an experience. And I, I expect that there's a way that I can much more directly talk about the experience once I have something like my own frame or my own set of frames for relating to it. I don't quite have that yet, but I feel it's settling in. But for now, um, I, I, hey, Matthew, I, I love this question. The question that haunts me is who slash what intends? Yeah, let that question haunt you. <laughs> That's probably where you're going. I love that. Um, what the, uh, my experience is I do. I am the one who intends, just like I am the one who experiences. If, uh, if you really want to get your own goat on this one, if you really want to needle yourself in this question, um, I recommend the book The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. He does an incredibly clear job of pointing at what the puzzle of self is in very plain language. Like, oh, <laughs> but saying, well, who intends? I do. It turns out it doesn't answer the question at all. But if you were to fully answer the question, um, I have not fully answered this question. I have a lot of clarity and I'm gaining more. And uh, legend has it that gaining complete clarity of this question causes the impression of having um, free will to evaporate, at least in the way that we normally think of it. 
Um, I haven't quite had that experience. I've, I've sort of knocked on that door. So the, the, um, the thing that I wanted to bring up today, the thing I wanted to focus on here, so, um, in the course of going through this over a couple of days, of having a very specific intention. What the intention is actually doesn't matter. The point is that I recognize this and then I just go, oh, manifestation is a matter of holding an intention. I see this very clearly now. So I'm going to hold the intention. This is the place of free will, and I choose to hold this intention. And then a whole bunch of things clicked together. One of the things that I mentioned yesterday is this delightful experience of any sense of obligation or like I'm doing things wrong, getting incinerated automatically. Enormous freedom, enormous emotional openness. But today, I woke up after a really solid eight hours of sleep feeling like a truck ran over me. <laughs> I, mean, I, I woke up utterly exhausted like did I wake up two hours early nope I got over eight hours of sleep that was a good night of sleep too I, fe I could feel how I had slept and I'd slept fine um, and uh, my body ached um, my head had this kind of tension in it um, just this fatigue it felt like it was at an energetic level almost like my bones were aching now, I've encountered this before this happens every time I try to make a major shift in a specific direction and in the past I would make a little bit of progress but often the tension would cause me to collapse because I didn't understand where my point of choice was and I was worried oh is this a sign in this case I'm experiencing it I'm not experiencing it now I actually worked through it I feel a lot more energized. I had to get another two-hour nap. Um, but uh, it's, it's actually, on one level, this is very mechanical. Like Part of what I did yesterday was in tuning into essence, one thing became very clear to me is, oh, my body isn't quite the right energetic shape. I know how to tune it. And I hadn't really done exercise for about a week, and I had gotten out of my usual daily-ish rhythm because I got possessed by a piece of writing. Um, and that just happens every now and then. Sometimes I just have to write. An essay has announced it will come through me. I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to get up and apparently this is what I'm doing. I thought I was going to like make breakfast, but apparently I'm going to spend two hours writing first. <laughs> so it sort of shook up a habit. So my body was a little out of tune, but not too much, like one week. And that's not terrible. Um, but there's this feeling of like, oh, I can feel the difference in the resonance between what my body carries and what the essence is that I want to embody, that I intend to embody and to channel and have go through me. So this channel, this vessel, sort of isn't quite tuned up in that with this intention. So holding that intention, I ended up doing a two-hour session. That's pretty normal for me when I when I do a session after a while of doing a general workout. And so some of these effects are just, oh, well, I worked out for two hours after a week of very little exercise. That's not too surprising that there would be some aches. Um, some of the headache relieved when I finally got some uh, food. So it turns out, oh, some of that was hunger, although I ate about an hour earlier than I normally do. So these, um, there are mechanical reasons to see each of these points, but, but overall I found one of the more interesting quirks is that I could not hold the intention. I mean, I'm, I'm oversimplifying a little bit what I mean by that, because of course I can hold the intention. That's the place of choice. But I could feel a way in which holding the intention was not in service to the intention. My mind would produce this particular kind of ache. So this is something that I think most people know about vividly. Um, there are much uh, less abstract contexts where this shows up all the time. You think of something like when you're chatting with somebody in a conversation and you're trying to remember the name of a mutual acquaintance or like there was some um, there was some character in a movie from 10 years ago and you're kind of like, what was that character's name? Yeah, I think it began with a B and it was like the person had this kind of funny green scarf. And, yeah, I know who you're talking about. Like, oh, who is it? Who is it? Ah, and so that, that's the stage of holding the intention, producing the effort. The body's doing all this extra stuff as part of the, the, the um, 
the response, but the holding the intention, I intend to remember, mind, what is the answer to this question, and just we're plugging in this effort. But then the mind, like, like the mind, like on some things, if I, like if I, um, uh, if I were to ask you, uh, where were you right before, like what were you doing right before you started listening to this video? You could probably reflect on it for a moment and then come up with the answer. Reflect on it for a moment is applying that trying. It's applying the intention to the mind. And the mind will probably just respond, I imagine. But with something like, what was the name? What was the name? Sometimes the right move, and you can tell when this is the right move, is to go, ah, whatever. Right? It's not that you don't care. It's that there's a recognition I mean, there are two things that can happen there. One is uh, the effort of doing that in real time, of efforting until you get the answer, um, doesn't feel worth it in the moment, and you go, you know, I'm done. But the other thing, and this is this is extremely common, of putting in the effort enough where you go, that's all I can do. Either it will happen on its own or it won't. It'll probably come to mind. The person's name will probably come to mind in a couple of minutes. Sometimes a couple of minutes later, sometimes a couple of seconds later, the name bursts into mind because the mind, I mean, bursts into mind, bursts into awareness, really. The mind has gone off, done its machinery in response to the request, in response to the intention. Okay. So it offers this answer, and then you can recognize, is that what I was looking for? Does that match my intent? Right. Oh, right, I remember the person's name. So um, the same thing shows up a lot in um, uh, learning a skill. I used to teach martial arts. And, and um, one way to not learn martial arts is to train all day, every day, nonstop. <laughs> you, you, know, you would think that would be a good way to do it. And it's, it's good at first. Somebody can learn a lot at first. Doing an occasional weekend or a week of intensive training can it can certainly tone the body but that's not the main point um, it can definitely emphasize all of these movements and getting getting the body into how do i um, do this no it, it, it's not this it's this so you're not here but here okay and and the, the, here's the why and here's all oh, right i need to move my foot here <sighs> okay relax 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 and it just feels like a million things the problem is that at some point, it's a different point for each person based on something like how strongly they hold the intent and how much they need to shift around in order for that intent to manifest in their bodies. There's a point that basically everybody reaches where the correct move is to take a break. Some of the biggest leaps in my own martial skill came from taking a couple of months off Often it was accidental. I was just like busy with college or something like that, and I would, uh, I would just be doing something else. I would, like, just like in the conversation when I can't remember the person's name, whatever, it'll come to mind. Let's go on. But going on is important so that the mind isn't consciously churning and referring back to. There's a need to set it aside to let go. Because the intention has already affected the mechanism, and now there is a need to let the ripple carry on. The same thing happens in the body for learning a physical skill. If you want to get really masterful at something, it's important not just to know what to practice and how to practice, but how to stop practicing and when to stop practicing. How much to rest. Okay. Uh, see, uh, Matthew adds, uh, oddly enough, I learned that stop and take a break best from puzzle games and hardcore action games like Bloodborne. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I learned it, despite my experience with martial arts, I learned it predominantly from math. You know, my master's degree is in mathematics. Um, the art of solving a really tricky problem is not you keep working on it until you answer it. And um, despite popular opinion, mathematics has, like, there's this important difference between mathematics and computation. Most people are only ever taught computation. But uh, mathematics, like mathema, same, same as polymath, the word 
Mathema is the ancient Greek word for knowledge. Mathematics is the mastery of knowing. Um, that's what it used to be. That used to be the entire focus of the discipline was the art of knowing. Um, and it still carries echoes of that, but most of that's been smashed to smithereens. In uh, mathematics, for me, there is um, an important component. So it, it's not just a matter of you either know how to solve the problem or you don't. And if you know how to solve the problem, then you're able to do the computation. And if you don't know how to solve it, then you just need to learn the method. There's a question of how do these methods come about? The answer to that question is actually mathematics. It is the art of knowing. So it's staring at the puzzle until a method of solving it emerges. In order to do that, it's really necessary to recognize the limit of conscious experience in engaging with, oh, at this point, my mind is full. At this point, my mind and my body have reached their limit for their capacity to receive an intention. So in alignment with my intention, the correct move is for me to change topics. So one thing all mathematicians learn how to do at some point, rarely taught this, but it's also something very organic. It's like nobody's taught how to walk, they just sort of figure it out. Um, in the same way, all mathematicians, as far as I can tell, there might be an exception or two here or there, but all of them learn the art of when to stop working on a problem and either work on a different problem or go do something completely unrelated to math. Because that is absolutely critical for progress. And this is a human universal, as far as I can tell, that part of the learning process, part of the transformation and manifestation process is learning when to rest. Um, okay. <laughs> Matthew's saying, uh, that explains so much about you. I didn't know any of that about math, yeah. Yeah, I think um, given the context in which you and I met, a, a reasonable way to understand how I orient is um, I am doing the mathematics of magic. I'm doing math with emotions and psyche and manifestation instead of with numbers and shape. That's me. <laughs> no. So. So coming back to this bit about the wearing out that I experienced, the kind of exhaustion. Um, on one level, this is a very, um, it, it is a mechanical result of having done some physical acts of trying to rearrange my mind. But it's also, it's also a feedback of, there, there are two types of things that can show up. One is this signal that it's a little bit different in every circumstance. Everybody in every different circumstance needs to learn a little bit differently what this signal is of the material that I am working with, the matter I am working with has just reached its limit of holding my intention and it needs time to rest and digest in order to receive more or to just complete it on its own. And that's a letting go movement. Right? That's one possibility. Okay. Another possibility is that this is the arising of, and this is particular to inner work, particularly to, the second one is particularly to inner work, when I am trying to, for instance, let go of a pattern in how I add drama in my romantic relationship. Um, if I'm doing that, then at some point it is very likely that some form of resistance will arise that is trying to keep me from completing the manifestation of that intention. And what will arise is exactly that which is the reason why I was doing the pattern in the first place. So resistance can show up as a kind of physical exhaustion, as mental fog, as doubt, because to the extent that the reason why, the, the embedded intention, the past intention that created the pattern in the first place is able to reach different components of my experience, it will use those in order to maintain itself. That's what ego is. So when I form a new intention, I'm going to sometimes encounter the need for rest and sometimes encounter egoic opposition. And so this gets back to uh, what Bentino Massaro called the day two challenge. So he was using days metaphorically. The idea is that there's a three day process where a day is more like a period. It's like a three phase. If he called it um, a phase one, phase two, and phase three, and we're talking about the phase two challenge, it would have been clearer, but that isn't what he did. And I want to be honest to where I got this from. So in day one, 
we set an intention. In day two, all the reasons why that intention hadn't already manifested to begin with boot up, almost like the universe popping up this um, dialogue box saying, about to implement intention, are you sure? Question mark, yes, no. And the way that you hit yes is you hold the intention even in the presence of the resistance. And then in day three, you've gotten through that and you have the solidity that you got the hint of at the beginning. I found this framework, although the terminology drives me a little batty, but I found the framework of having just the simple language of, oh, this is a day two challenge. <laughs> it gives me a crisp thing to grab onto. Oh, this is a day two challenge. Okay. But there is a puzzle. How do you distinguish between day two challenge versus in alignment with the intention, there is a need for rest? Okay. Let's see, there's a little bit more here, so let me check. Um, um, oh, Matthew Huff is uh, referring to the earlier bit about math. Uh, memory bubble. I learned this term diffuse learning from a book uh, called A Mind for Numbers. Okay, I don't think I've heard of diffuse learning. Um, I imagine that's talking about this rest period. It's neat that uh, somebody referenced that. Um, part of where I started explicitly thinking about this stuff was from um, in, in doing my PhD work. My PhD was in math education. My master's degree was in math. And for my PhD work, one of the books that I dove into and I studied a lot was, um, well, not a lot, but I worked through it um, pretty solidly and had a lot of discussions with my advisor about it. Um, it was called, um, oh heavens, I'm not going to be able to remember its name. Um, wow, I can't remember the name or the author right now. <laughs> It'll come to me in a minute. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, it was it was a uh, a book that was um, going uh, on about the um, the phenomenology of struggle in mathematics, on and the way that mathematicians deal with the um, the process of creation. But it was it was actually a survey of both the written accounts of um, mathematicians from earlier centuries and also present interviewing a bunch of different mathematicians by a mathematician who was very familiar with this work. Um, so getting to see how vivid this principle was and when I recognized it in martial arts and I recognized it in learning to play music, um, there was this vivid sense of, I think this is a learning universal. This is just part of what it means. So in terms of these uh, distinguishing between what difference between egoic resistance and the, um, and the need for rest in order to complete, Part of the reason this difference matters so much is egoic resistance. The reason it's there is to stop the new intention from manifesting. And so the correct answer to this one is to push through. But the purpose of the rest, the call for rest, is in service to the implementation of the intention. And so the correct answer here is to let go to back off. So in one you punch through and in the other you let go. So how do you tell? And for me there's a lot of clarity about this one. The short answer is if you can't tell then you're coming from a part that shouldn't be making the call about which one it is. And I'm smiling because there's sort of this impish uh, self-reference here. And in particular, in our modern culture, this is kind of irritating because there's this um, like, well, what's the algorithm? How do you tell? What are the signs? But what's going on there? Like, I, I relate a lot to that. I imagine a lot of others do, too. I don't know how much of the population does, but I've encountered this quite a lot. The issue is that it's not about the signs on the outside. It's not about, oh, well, it's because if there's a heat in my chest or if there's a sense of openness or trust. That's not it at all. The fact that when a resistance shows up, it's hard to tell which one it is, is coming from um, a part primarily of the mind that is really a part of the ego that is trying to make this distinction. The ego is not really a monolithic thing. It's more like a collection of a bunch of different um, um, energetic bubbles of intention that sort of 
build on each other in this kind of evolved way. We've sort of built them up. It's like having a ball pit. <laughs> a ball pit has a net behavior, an overall behavior, um, but that's not because each ball has a plan or the balls even have a plan to coordinate. It's just what happens when you toss a whole bunch of balls in a pit. <laughs> the ego is like a ball pit. There's, um, there can be an emergent intelligence that comes that the ball pit analogy doesn't really capture very well. But for the most part, it's not a plan. It's not a monolithic thing. It's more like a bunch of components that link up in a particular way. So there can be one part of the ego that is resisting and another part of the ego that is trying to feel better by implementing this intention like then identifies with the grasps onto the intention and is now trying to figure out, well, is it resistance from some part of that stupid ego, not recognizing it's implicitly talking about itself, because it's blaming um, the ball pit balls and it's not realizing it's looking around and it can see them because it's a ball pit ball. Um, but it's going, well, is it another ball pit ball? Or should I actually just back off? Which do I do? Ah, ah. And, and well, the answer is if you can't tell, then you're coming from inside one of the balls. So, Take a breath. And check, can you feel your knees? You lost track of your knees, you lost track of the backs of your legs, what it feels like for your feet to be touching the ground or whatever they're touching. What it feels like for your breath to be moving your shirt. If you've lost touch of the physicality of being an incarnate creature here, not as a concept, but as an immediate lived experience. If you've lost track of what it feels like to have a tongue, then that means you're coming from inside of a thought bubble. And inside of the thought bubble, most of your senses don't work. So it's not too surprising you can't tell the difference. If you ground, like my experience is, the more I ground, particularly the more I ground in my essence, which I'm, I keep giving this thing of, oh, I'll talk about this at some point, still not now, but noting it actually matters to ground in essence as opposed to something else. Another way to say this is to ground in the experience of truth, not the concept of truth, not the logical idea of truth, but the experience of truth. The way in which when I know, yeah, I can feel my tongue in my mouth. That's true. How do I know? It's nice that you want to ask a question, right? <laughs> I don't care. It's true. And this is one of the foundations on which my ability to orient to anything is built. So I'm not concerned about it. I wouldn't, it doesn't make sense to answer the question. I know it. That's true. Right? So that sense of truth, grounding in that sense of truth, makes it very straightforward not only to tell what is true, but to also tell when I can't tell what is true when I am ignorant, when my senses are not sufficient. Right now, I cannot tell where the moon is. Lost physical track. But that's true. So from that grounding, it's very easy to tell whether this is egoic resistance or if this is the call to rest. I don't have this kind of conflict when, for instance, I'm playing guitar. And at some point, I get a sense of, okay, and that's enough. Why is it enough? Is it because, well, I have this intention to learn guitar, but now my ego is a potent. I mean, maybe, but, <laughs> but the reason I engage with guitar is because I'm having fun. And like, I'm not trying to become a master guitarist. Um, in fact, until, until I solve the problem where I can't do this on my left hand, <laughs> I'm probably not going to be able to do well with guitar. Um, but um, like I know what that feeling is like. I can tell. Uh, okay, my my brain has gotten enough. I mean that's a model. It's a it's a very particular experience. Oh, it's time to let go. And if I do that, then what it means to actually take the intention seriously, rather than grasp onto the intention of an egoic part. Right? I'm not I'm not like instead of having some part of my ego boot up and then trusting it to hold my intention for me. I'm choosing. And if I am choosing sincerely to learn guitar, then when that hesitation comes up, there's a sense of, oh, great. So in service to learning, 
it is now good for me to set this aside. There's no question. Okay. So here's another comment. Uh, uh, Matthew says, I hear that as the sense of I am that I am in regards to essence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you might, um, uh, you in particular, uh, because of a uh, shared context in the wealth community, you might uh, get a kick out of this. Um, the uh, uh, I am that I am is attributed to chokmah, the, the second sphere of the Kabbalistic tree of life. Um, and uh, in uh, at least the Golden Dawn's traditions for talking about the, uh, the tree of life, the line from chokmah to tifereth, from this I am that I am to the heart of power that is the alchemist's gold, that line is the line of magical power. Um, the, uh, um, wow, have I forgot? Oh, yeah, normally it's the path of the emperor, um, the path of he. Um, Although in uh, in Crowley's system, they switches it out for uh, um, for the star, he puts the star up there. Um, yeah, so in in some sense, talking about bringing down power by the capacity of connection between the heart and the I am. Metaphorically speaking, um, I also find some of the Golden Dawn's ways of approaching things kind of irritating, <laughs> but I thought you might get a kick out of that. Yeah, um, so um, part of why I wanted to talk about all this is earlier today when I was thinking, oh man, I'm, 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 my daily live stream today is going to be a pain. It's going to be painful to do uh, because I, I was a zombie. I was a zombie. <laughs> um, my system really needed rest. I pushed it quite far yesterday, which makes sense given two days of intense devotional work. And uh, now I've gotten enough rest, I feel energized, I feel clear, and I feel the deepened roots. A little bit of resting and leaning into it that's going um, uh, to continue on, but I'm expecting uh, a lot of, uh, I'm expecting to get back into it in the full swing, especially tomorrow. And also, um, there's, there's for me this kind of excitement of, just so you know, this is a thing. This is such a common thing. Um, if I used to feel a lot of uh, guilt and frustration when I would go through these, um, what felt to me like collapses in trying to do personal transformational work. Um, just having this simple frame of, oh, day two challenge. Um, it's, I, I later found it frustrating because I didn't know, well, how do you distinguish between egoic resistance that you push through and this need to rest where you don't push through? They're opposite actions in order to achieve the same goal and they look the same. How do you tell? And the answer is, well, the part that's asking can't. The part that's asking cannot tell the answer. So what it needs to do is let go. Not of, not of the, do I push through or not? Oh, I mean, sorry. Yes, that. It doesn't let go of the intention. It lets go of the choice of whether to push through or not. That's not its, it's not in a position to make that call. And it is what it, you feel like when you're identified with it. So just recognizing, oh, if I'm confused, take a breath and B. Remember that I am here. Ah. <sighs> right. And if I still can't tell, generally that means that the body is too activated and the thing that is most in service at all is taking a break. <laughs> getting the body calm again, getting embodied again, feeling this being here. So I just find it really helpful to know that, and in particular to notice, oh, sometimes this is going to feel very hard, and that's part of the sign of progress. Nothing shameful about it at all. Not that there's anything to be ashamed of at all, ever, anywhere. <laughs> okay, so that's all I've got for tonight. Um, if I still feel like this, then um, if I feel like this tomorrow, then maybe tomorrow I'll give a stab at talking about essence. So I'm, there's actually a lot of affection, a lot of warmth, like a heart love that feels very connected to this. It's a source of enormous clarity and power. Um, so I look forward to talking about that whenever I do. 
and uh, tomorrow will be the two-thirds point for, for this. So, um, yeah, thank you for listening. Um, yeah, you're welcome, Matthew. Right. And uh, good night.